Wow, what a pleasure to be here in Bologna. I have a secret that I'd like to share with you tonight. Hmm, a secret. The secret of how to live a thousand lives. But first, I'd like to, um, I'd like to say that I've spent about 20 years of my life studying trust systems. And it's something that's near and dear to my heart, so I hope to take you on a journey tonight that is worth your time. Let's start with a question. How many people here, now raise your hands, actually look around. Pick somebody else in the audience around you. Somebody who looks trustworthy. Somebody who looks trustworthy. Now raise your hands if you would allow that person to stay at your home tonight without you being there, completely unattended, raise your hand, would you let that person who looks trustworthy stay at your home? Raise your hand. Okay, we have a few people. Now, what if I told you that that person has 20 positive reviews from people all over the world that already said that they are a good human and that in the past they've stayed at other people's homes and it was great. How many people would now host that person in your home? A little few more, maybe. What if I told you that in two years' time, if you had hosted that person, you may have a new best friend, you may learn some things about yourself and the world, and it may have changed your life? Raise your hands if you might host that person. Cool. That's great. So here's the secret. Here's the secret. Life is, the quality of our lives are related to transactions and relationships, primarily relationships. The more relationships we have in our life, the more life we can have. But how do you get people to connect with you? How do you get people to have transactions and relationships with you? Well, you have to have trust. Trust is what determines whether people will transact and relate to you. But how do you get trust? Trust is hard. I mean, we're constantly building trust in our lives, constantly waiting to see if somebody is trustworthy, right? That's the trick. We're, we're trying to, we need to remove the waiting time. And then the next question comes in, well, what is trust? If you ask 20 different people, 20 people might say 20 different things. Is it, you know, how well you know about my needs or how predictable I am? Different things to different people. And there's even what happens when trust is broken. I've had my trust broken many times in my life. Any times your trust gets broken, it's a small percent, like maybe the 1% that breaks your trust. But the danger is you start to recalibrate your trust and you trust less. But the less you trust, the less life you get. So the trick is, how do you figure out who's trustworthy and how do you, how do you uh, connect with those people and relate and transact? That's the key. That's the key to getting more life. So my story be with trust began a long time ago in a small town in Brownfield, Maine. I was a very shy kid, but I wanted to go see the world. And in this town where I came from, you could trust anybody. You know, it's a small town. You could, people, everybody's trustworthy. A couple years later, I went on a trip to Egypt, and I decided to take some risks when I was there. Uh, the tourists in the country, there were no tourists in the country. Tourists had just been murdered outside of a temple. So the, tourist, the, the, the country was just empty. And I befriended a taxi cab driver, me and my friend, and we decided to go around. We rode camels and you know, did some of the normal things. But then, after a while, he invited us to go home with his family. Seems maybe risky, but we decided, OK, and we did. And it was cool. It was, there was a wedding happening, and it was after wedding ceremony. And then we were smoking hookah with the granddads and telling stories. It was really cool. And then, of course, talk turned to climbing the pyramids, right? And they said, oh, you can't do that. It hasn't happened in a long time. And we pushed a little bit. And then he said, well, I can make a call. So he decided to make a call. He got phone. He says, OK, well, so here's the thing. We've got to meet this guy at 4 AM in a dark alley. I thought to myself, hmm, hmm, what should I do? <laughs> I, I could go and it could be the experience of a lifetime. Or I could go and I could never, that would be the last thing I remember. Or I could stay and wonder what would have happened for the rest of my lifetime. I decided to go. I decided to trust, and amazing things happened. We met that, 
that kid in the dark alley at 4 a.m., and he, he knew the guards. He was friends with them. He took us up onto the plateau. He introduced us. We made friends, and they said, go, run, climb the pyramid. We're like, whoa, what? I'm just 19. I don't, is that okay? <laughs> we ran, we climbed to the top, and I remember sitting there right on the edge, looking out over the desert and over Giza, thinking, just mind blown. This is what happens when you trust dangers? Okay, seems good. And then later that night, we were invited to go into the, into the uh, pyramid. And I was able to uh, turn, we were t we turned the lights off and then slept at the king's sarcophagus for half hour. Again, mind blown. If I'm just 19 and I'm taking these risks and I'm trying to use my intuition to know who to trust and it's working, what else could I do in my life? A couple years later, got my second, another lesson in trust. I went to Burning Man. Now, Burning Man's amazing. It's like every single person there is trustworthy. It's, everybody there is a super cooperator. It's difficult to get there. There's a filter. So anybody who gets there has to cooperate, has to try really hard. And when I'm going around and walking around, it's like I'm seeing people. And above each person's head, I felt like there was a little trust symbol floating above their head. And when I looked around, it was like I, I felt like every single person there was trustworthy. Wow. I could walk up to anyone, ask for help, I need a hammer, whatever, and lo and behold, people help me. So that really started to give me this idea. How could a website online show who's trustworthy and make it so that everybody is trustworthy? And I started to wonder what the value of trust is, and I researched. Turns out that 25% of our world's GDP just might be locked up in trust and control infrastructure. What does that mean? Think of countries like Scandinavia. Scandinavia, there's a lot of trust. Scandinavia doesn't need bars on their windows, and they don't need lawyers. They have trust, so they get a boost to their GDP. But countries maybe like Brazil and other countries, well, if there's less trust, you need more lawyers. You need more bars on your windows. That's control infrastructure. When you need control infrastructure, it's a drain on your economy, and your GDP goes down. Interesting, so there's clearly some value of trust. A couple of years later, I went to Iceland, another lesson. I decided that I was going to spam a bunch of university students. I had hacked into the University of Iceland student directory, extracted 1,500 names and emails, and I constructed a mail spam saying, Dear Bjorn, I'm coming to Iceland. Can I stay with you? And between 50 and 100 people said, Yes, come stay. And keep in mind, I'm a very shy person. So when this, this model invited me to go stay with her and her friends, and I followed her and her friends around just like, all weekend, like, whoa. That was mind-blowing for me. And it got me out of my comfort zone. It was like super, super uncomfortable for me to put myself in a situation like that. But it helped me grow. And it helped me learn about myself. And I left Iceland on that airplane. I remember, just remember sitting there. I remember exactly where I was in the plane. I said, I want to travel like this every time. And Couchsurfing was born. Couchsurfing was born, and I started getting to work on it. Iceland was like an MVP. In Iceland, I sent that email. In that email, I said, this is why I'm trustworthy. Would you trust me? Pictures, philosophy. And people said, yes, I don't know you, but I will trust you because you have trust indicators. And that's what Couchsurfing is about. I knew how it needed to work, so I got to work, and Couchsurfing started to grow. And no longer would I need to be a ghost walking around Europe, looking at statues, taking a picture, and going home. And then another lesson happened. The lesson of transferable trust. Once in Couchsurfing, once people started to build trust over here and then use it over there, they started to experience what transferable trust is about. Life and relationships and transactions accelerate. Here's Emily. Emily sends a message to someone saying, I'd like to stay at your house. Can I stay? Gets the response back, I'm sorry, I'm not home right now, but since you have 20 positive references and you look really cool, go ahead, the key's in the garden, I'll see you in two days, have fun. Right? Emily's life just got accelerated. That transaction just got accelerated. Emily just got more life. It's pretty powerful. And that's what Couchsurfing is about. Couchsurfing started to grow like wildfire. People got, got to, we've gotten to instantly transact and relate to people around the world we don't know, and our lives are enhanced. And a lot of us have felt like, well, wouldn't it be so great if we could do this outside of Couchsurfing? That would be so cool. Couchsurfing became perhaps the world's largest trust experiment of all time. I learned a lot over those years of running Couchsurfing. 
about 10 years. And what I learned was that the world is a good place when, when, you want, when uh, people want to trust each other. And when you want to go somewhere and you want to get off a plane, you're wondering, will you be okay? You will be. Cal surfers feel that every day. Get off a plane, it feels safe. The world is a good place. People ask me, well, how did you build Couchsurfing? I mean, that's really cool. You've got this, this organization, this network, but how did you get people from all over the world to work together and build this scalable thing? It, it grew like exponentially around the world. Well, here's how I think we did it. If you research, there's different types of organizations. If you can have a super cooperation organization, that organization is going to do pretty well. But if you have an organization, like on the left side of this chart, that, that the, the feeling in the organization is life sucks, People are just surviving. How can you get any work done when people are just surviving? So you, that one certainly doesn't work. Now let's take a look at the middle chart. That one's where most of the world is at, 50% or so. The feeling is, I'm great and you're not. It's where people are holding on to information. Information is power. And people give out information to maximize their power. Now, everybody in the organization has a different idea, idea of what is real. You can't distribute decision making, and you can't scale that organization. Now take a look at the organization on the right. That organization feels like we are great. Information is shared completely. Anybody could probably make an OK decision in, across organization-wide. Everybody has a complete picture of reality. That is a super cooperation. That is, a, that is something that can scale. But then when you dig down a little bit, little bit further, you get to teams. Now at the team level, you've got people that operate in different ways. You've got givers, matchers, and takers, generally speaking. There's more to it, but that's a simplified model. Givers, if you have any amount of givers on a team, that team's going to do very well. They're just going to give and help each other out. If you've got matchers, well, they're just making sure that everything's equal. Your economy of getting things done slows down a bit, but still, you can get there. It's OK, but any amount of takers destroys the whole thing. Things get weird. People slow down. Things get unpredictable. It doesn't move forward. What will the future be? What will the future be when it comes to trust? Some people in the world, they think that we are going to have a single dimension of trust in the future for each person, or maybe a few dimensions of trust. Some people think that a trust score is going to be worth more than money. I think so. I think that a universal trust system is inevitable. It's coming. We're starting to see signs of it. No, we're not all seeing signs of it. Certain people in certain places in the world are seeing signs of this, but it's something to pay attention to. So I want to share this with you so you can start to have a lens in which to look into the future. First, you've got to understand what siloed trust is. We all know about siloed trust. Siloed trust, that is websites and trust systems and reputation systems we use every day. Couchsurfing, you, you build up a reputation with a bunch of reviews there, great. You can't take that reputation and those reviews over to Yelp. You can't take it over to eBay. That doesn't work. It works within a silo. Now, universal trust. What is universal trust? Universal trust is when you can take your reputation from one system and go use it somewhere else, and maybe somewhere else, and collect it here and use it there. It's a hard problem to solve, but it's starting to be solved. In fact, the closest version we have in the United States now is something called FICO. It's a credit score system. Banks use it to determine whether you should get a loan. If you have a good score, you could get a loan. You get a better, bigger loan, something. Uh, but now people are using it for not just giving loans. Let's say you were con you're considering someone as a roommate, someone you maybe you live with. You might look at their FICO score to determine if they're going to be a good roommate. Are they going to clean up the dishes? Well, let me look at your FICO score. Kind of interesting, right? It's kind of apples and oranges, but that's the best system that's available. I've been spending the last couple of years working on this project called Wonder, which we don't want to reduce people to any just one dimension. It's like, what are your personal dimensions, professional dimensions, and other dimensions? Our belief is that we don't want to reduce people to one number. Nobody wants to be one number. We're human, right? Humans don't want to be one number. I don't want to be one number. Now, I should talk a little bit about some dystopian systems. For those of you who aren't sure what that word means, a utopian system would be a good future, a system in a good future, or a good system in the future. Now, a dystopian system is maybe a bad system in the future. <laughs> it's one we don't want the future to look like. Recently, Black Mirror portrayed one of these dystopian futures. Everybody was reduced to a single uh, credit score or social credit score, and you couldn't get 
you couldn't rent a car, you couldn't do all kinds of things, you couldn't hang out with cool people, you couldn't get a certain home if you didn't have a good enough score. China's doing this now. You know, it reduces people to one, one dimension. It's if you don't have a good enough score, you can't travel, you can't um, maybe get a loan, and maybe sometimes that, those dimensions are based on who your political party is. I mean, there's all kinds of ways where it can look like a system that helps support us to thrive as humans or kind of control us, right? So I ask you all to close your eyes. Bear with me, just close your eyes. Imagine, think for a second, imagine it's five years from now, you're going to wake up, you're going to wake up five years from now. What's it going to be like? Trust systems, all of these reputation systems, they're going to be bigger, they're going to be sewn into our lives more and more and more. And you're going to be either happy or unhappy about that day going forward, I think. Are you going to experience a system that treats you like a human, that is diverse, celebrates your diversity, that you're kind of in control, and you can uh, become the best person you want to be and have a really great life, something you're inspired to go live your day? Or is it going to be a system of control? Is it going to be a system that doesn't honor your diversity but tries to make you into a single perfect person? These are big questions. But the future isn't written yet. So it's really, it's really up to all of us to think about this. And it's up to us to choose. Thank you.